Um, good evening, everybody, and good morning for those of you who are following us from everywhere in the world. Uh, my name is Laura Leuzzi. Um, I'm an art historian curator and I'll be hosting this event. I would like, first of all, to thank uh, Dr. Valentino Catigrala uh, for this kind invitation and uh, the Maker Fair for uh, having us and for the great organization. It is uh, an honor to introduce Ken Goldberg, who actually needs no introduction. Um, Ken Goldberg is the William S. Floyd Distinguished Chair in Engineering at UC Berkeley and an award-winning roboticist, filmmaker, artist, and popular public speaker on AI and robotics. Ken trains the next generation of researchers and entrepreneurs in his research lab at UC Berkeley. He has published over 300 papers, three books, and holds nine US patents. Ken art, Ken's artwork has been featured in over 70 art exhibits, including the 2000 Whitney Biennial. He is a pioneer in technology and artistic visual expression, bridging the two cultures of art and science. He has presented over 600 lectures all over the world. The floor is yours, uh, Ken. Uh, thank you so much, Laura. I really thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my screen. And I want to say also thank you to Valentino and all the organizers. The, the, the slides I'm going to present are from a, pro a new project that my students and I have been working on that I'm really excited to talk about today. So I want to step back though for a minute and just talk about the agriculture more broadly and the and all of the challenges that we're facing in, in, in agriculture and food supply. And as you know, there is it's a huge part of the world population are engaged with agriculture, with growing food and, and growing plants. And it's a very rich and complex process. There's a trend today in bringing digital technology in, into, into farming and agriculture. And this is a one typical slide which shows that because of, of things like uh, networking, wireless networking, the ability to have drones and satellite information coordinated with, um, with sensors on the ground, with machinery, that there's, an, a, there's a possibility of being able to be more productive and effective at, at, at agriculture. So there's a, a, a real trend and there's a number of companies that are very actively engaged in this, doing research in ro robots for agricultural applications and it's really increased dramatically in the last few years. So these are a couple of the examples of, of, of robots. In fact, many farms have a quite sophisticated robot technology already in place. There's examples like this, which is being able to, this is a robot system that's able to scan as the tractor moves through the field, it's able to scan each individual plant and identify whether it's, whether it's growing properly or if it has potentially, there's weeds or some, some imperfection, and then it can make adjustments in fertilizers or in water. And this is the idea behind precision irrigation, which is very exciting because it means that uh, that that um, that irrigation can then be um, tailored to the very specific aspects of the garden itself. And let me just see here, hide floating meaning controls. Good. All right. And um, so these are other examples of these machines and robots that are being designed and actually are already available commercially. There's also robots being used in once once fruits or vegetables have been picked, that robots are being used to to to, to manipulate to be able to to inspect and um, pack uh, things like uh, vegetables and fruits. And there's a major project at Google, for example, that was just announced this fall. It's called Mineral, and it's using a variety of techniques to be able to really probe the soil very, very, at a very precision, at a precise level to understand what are the nutrients, the, the drainage variations, lighting variations across a particular patch of land. So that again, the, the watering and the, and, the, and the soil can be adjusted to, and the amount of, of, of fertilizers and planting can be adjusted appropriately. And drones are a huge part of this too, as we see that there's, 
the drones can be used for inspection, but also they're being used for um, actually very precisely locating fertilizers and, um, and pesticides. So a big issue is water. And if you, global water usage, I mean, when we talk about all the fresh water available and, and used across the world, that approximately three quarters of this is being used for agriculture. And a good amount of that is, is, is for plants. And so one project that my colleagues and I have been very interested in in the last few years is what we call um, RAPID, Robot Assisted Precision Irrigation Delivery. So focused on the irrigation aspect and trying to, to, to use robots to deliver irrigation in precisely where it's needed to minimize, to, to reduce overwatering. This is an example of what's called flood irrigation. That's where we, a field is just flooded with, with water and making sure that all plants are, get sufficient amount. But as, a, as you can see, is, is, is vastly over waters, large areas of, the, of, the, of, a, of a plant area. This is a, a, a great improvement. This is a, um, um, with, with, uh, with two, using tubing and drip irrigation. So this can greatly reduce the amount of water that's used. And drip, drip irrigation has been pioneered in a number of countries, including Israel, and is being used all over the world and has a big benefit because it delivers the water directly to the roots of the plant. So it reduces, it reduces um, evaporation. Now, there's another idea that people are excited about, which is how can we use sensors and uh, valves uh, out in the field. So wireless devices that can adjust the watering on the fly. And so there's a number of projects that have been looking into this. The challenge, of course, is that the price, the cost of these valves is non-trivial. They have to be provided with electricity. So they, they, um, they, they have to be actuated. And the environment in fields is not particularly ideal for electronics. So you have a lot of moisture, you have animals, insects, and so that it's a big challenge to, to put these kind of devices into place across, let's say at every plant in an environment. Although the one place it might work is in vineyards because vineyards are, have very, very high yield in terms of the, of the yield per plant. Now the idea of practical precision irrigation is, is relatively new. Can we use the, the, the drip irrigation and make it even more precise? And the idea here is to, is to replace the standard irrigator with a little device that is passive. It's just a, essentially a screw. And it basically allows you to change by rotating it, it allows you to change the amount of water that comes out at each irrigation point. So this is a device that my colleagues and I have developed. It's called the Device for Automated Tuning of Emitters. And it's a handheld device that you can carry around and you can, you can basically use it to adjust the emitters in a, in a very large area like a farm. And from a maker's fair point of view, we, I wanted to share this with you. This was put together from an old um, electric screwdriver and uh, put patched together by, by an, uh, a great team of, of students. And the idea though is it's a prototype of how this system would be used. It has the idea being it has GPS and wireless communication with a, with a global site that's been monitored by satellite or by uh, drones. And then it, it irrigates and, and determines where from the air, where which plants need more irrigation or maybe uh, less irrigation. And then as the workers move through the field, they get alerted and then they can move this device to the appropriate emitter and make the adjustment. So we just got a patent on this. Happy to say, and uh, my colleagues Stefano Carpin and uh, Stavros uh, Virgilius and uh, Steve McKinley, David Gilly, we're all uh, partners on this. Uh, now, Stefano is also looking into the idea of taking this a step further and having a robot that can move through the field, and um, and then make these adjustments. And the beauty of this is that the robot could operate at night or essentially when no one else is around. And the advantage is that we don't have to make these adjustments very often. We estimate that each emitter would have to be adjusted once every one or two weeks. And so over the course of a, uh, the robot can move through the field and uh, essentially make these adjustments throughout the evening. And that way it would be able to, to keep up with the, um, the number of adjustments and it wouldn't require human intervention. So again, coming back to plants and the idea of, of gardening, farming with reducing um, uh, uh, 
of resources. I want to also make a distinction between monoculture and polyculture. So monoculture is where is, is by far the dominant way of, of growing um, food is where we plant individual, very nicely separated rows of the same plant over and over again. So it's monolithic. It's, it's, there's one plant in a field. And that's, that can be very successful. And um, it, it, however, the alternative is polyculture, where we plant different plants together in close proximity. And polyculture actually has a much longer history. That was the original way that, that farming and irrigation and, and, and agriculture was performed. And it mixes different plant types. And the advantages are that the plants can be mutually supported. They can, they can resist, they're more resistive to, to pests and, and disease. So they require less, less, uh, less pesticides. They also can interestingly cross fertilize each other. So there's a reduction in the need for fertilizers. And because of the root structure variation, they're more resilient, they, re they require less watering. So there's a lot of wonderful potential to polyculture but it requires more labor because the plants tend to intergrow. They don't grow all at the same rates. And so we get this challenge where the plants start to, uh, one plant can take over from other plants. So human labor is very intensive here and has to, to be used to, to monitor and, and adjust the plants of each type. Now, this has been challenging. Obviously, I'm, I'm showing you, here's the, a, a scene from the last year where COVID-19 has radically changed the, the situation. It's much harder to find workers. Workers are, are, are in shorter supply and it's more dangerous to work. So an ongoing question is, can we, can we do some kind of automation for polyculture farming? In other words, can we assist the humans, not replace them, but can we assist humans by having some sort of automation that could work in a farm like this? Now I'll take now a step back in time to 25 years ago, my, my students and I developed a, a system called the, uh, an art project called the Telegarden. And it is a, a real living garden that was what we set up initially in a lab and then it was moved to a museum. But the idea was that we put an industrial robot arm in the center and then we attached this whole thing to the internet. And if you remember, uh, well, some of you will remember the early days of the internet, 1995, it was, it was just starting out. There was no such thing as Google. There was no Facebook. It was very early. Um, and this shows you the, uh, an overview of the garden at work. It, because it was a global project, we made it available to anyone on the internet any time of the day or night. So it had um, operated 24 hours a day. So that's why the headlights are on it. And then it was allow people to go in. To, there were cameras so you could look at the garden, but also you could plant and water your own seed. So the idea was it was it was fully interactive system. And when we put it online, we, we didn't know how many people would be interested, if any. And um, what we were, we were surprised to find that initially hundreds and thousands, then it was starting to get covered in the, in the press and the London Times and the CBS News. So then it became very popular. And in the course of the nine years it was online, it was accessed by over 100,000 people. So we, what happened, if any of you are gardeners, you'll know that uh, when you plant so many seeds in a small radius, this was uh, three meters by three meters, that you could it would quickly overgrow. And so it became really a study in the tragedy of the commons, the, the idea that there's limited resources and how can a, uh, a system keep up with, um, with the demand. And it was really, there was a, there was a lot of, of dynamics involved of, of the interactions between humans. In fact, there was a study that was written um, by, by two, two computer scientists who looked at the chat room of the telegarden and analyzed the, the kind of behavior. And it was, since it was very early days, it was uh, for the internet, it was very different than, than a lot of the, the commentary on social media today. We can talk more about that later, but it was a, there was a sort of interesting self-selection of the group they were pioneers on the internet. They were also interested in gardens and so tended to be very, very sociable and, um, and compatible. Now we resulted, this project resulted in a book and was, um, the, the garden was moved to Ars Electronica in, uh, in, in Austria where it stayed online for the next eight years. And uh, I moved to Berkeley and we, I with, was with a philosopher there, Hubert Dreyfus, we, we wrote a book and um, 
we invited eight philosophers, eight engineers, and eight artists to write chapters um, that were related or inspired by um, um, the idea of the internet. And um, we also coined a new word, telepistemology, that, uh, that never caught on. <laughs> but um, the idea of telepistemology was that there was this, there was this ambiguity between, um, between virtual reality and digital reality. Because we were presenting this garden, there were questions had been raised that was it, was it in fact a real garden or was it a simulated garden? And that question caught us a bit by surprise 25 years ago. But as we started thinking about it, it, it became really interesting that it was possible to, to make a synthetic garden. And this is this distinction here that you may, that as in fact, at, in the past 25 years, virtual reality has gotten much more sophisticated and what you might call distal reality, the ability to access environments over a distance, such as we're doing right now through Zoom, has also gotten much more sophisticated. So the, the, the boundary between these two things is getting blurred, is getting more difficult to, to, to distinguish. And in fact, the whole idea of augmented reality has further intermixed these two, these two um, phenomena. So this brings us to this year, 2020 Alpha Garden. And what we wanted to do is revisit the, the, the telegarden. And we, my, my students and I were interested in, again, in polyculture and, the, and also particularly interested in, in, in robots and AI. And as everyone here knows, there's been a huge resurgence in artificial intelligence, largely because of deep learning, which in turn comes from the availability of large amounts of data, large amounts of computing, and new algorithms for doing bat propagation or maintaining the, the weights in a very large network. So we were curious whether a robot was now sufficiently sophisticated to be able to tend a polyculture garden. And again, we see it as an art project, which we can talk about, for, for, we'll talk about afterward. And so we started building this in uh, just over a year ago in October of, of, 19, of 2019. And we purchased a, uh, a, a robotic frame from a wonderful company called FarmBot that I want to give credit to. They, uh, they, are, they produce these from California. They're available to anyone in the world. They are it's a, basically a gantry robot or XYZ frame. So they provide the, the hardware. And then you can it basically allows this robot um, irrigation and camera device to be moved throughout the garden. So this is what ours looks like. We set it up at Berkeley at the greenhouse. And so you can, you can see that this is actually a late stage where it's fairly overgrown. Um, the, we have grow lamps and we have a camera overhead. So the system is, um, is set up so that it can um, go through and, and irrigate. The, um, we also have a, uh, a new pruning tool that uh, the students have designed a beautiful device that can go in and, and selectively prune. And then we have irrigation uh, as you see on the right. Um, now, this is showing you a time-lapse of the, um, an early time-lapse of the system working. So we have a camera again overhead and this is a, a actually this is a more recent time-lapse showing how the system evolved in just in October. And um, so you can see the very rapid growth. And, and what we're trying to do is track individual plants as they grow and build models of their growth so that we can predict and adjust the garden over time. So in, in subsequent seasons, we can optimize the placement of the seeds so that they're, they're, they, they don't encroach on each other unnecessarily and that we can also allow for diversity optimize diversity in the garden. Now, um, because gardens grow very slowly and the time constant is very long, we developed a simulator that we could use to run, to try different policies, control policies for different gardens. So here you're seeing the simulator running for 64 gardens in parallel. The little red squares are, are pruning events. And so they're each running slightly different policies. So you see that the, now we can study the outcome, the, the behavior, and we can quantify that in terms of coverage and diversity, which is a me which we measure in terms of a, a in terms of entropy in the garden. And what we can then do is use this to very rapidly tune different uh, control uh, policies. Now, um, obviously, the the simulation is never 
per perfectly uh, identical to reality because of this inherent complexity of physical of, of physical gardens in the natural world. So this shows you two snapshots from the system at, uh, at day 15 and day 30. The below is the simulation and above is the real garden. So you see there's some there's some similarities, but um, but of course it's not perfect. What we're doing now is is building um, new versions where we're very carefully monitoring growth and tuning our simulation to the growth. This is a, a process that's known as sim to real, which is a very active topic in the research literature. And here's our one version of this where you're seeing the, the, the simulation in the circles and the real plant growth in uh, overlaid. And um, so that you were trying to approximate to these circles very nicely capture the, the true growth of the plants. Now, there's a quite a bit more to say on the technical aspects of this. We've published a paper this summer on the simulator, and we have a new paper that's under review right now on the, the first phase of um, starting to, to develop the controller for this. I, I want to also mention the context of this in, as an artwork. So originally it was uh, presented in a uh, in an art show that was that opened in January of 2020 in New York City, uh, it was um, this was a, a show that was um, basically about the issue of intelligence, and the and, and it was a um, a number of artworks that curated by Christian Paul that studied artificial intelligence from a variety of different perspectives, and for us. The garden was was really a question about whether a garden, whether an, an, a robot or an artificial intelligence could keep up with the complexities of nature. And then this happened. Um, we had no idea when we were developing this. We, in fact, we rushed to install in, uh, the, the versions by the date of the opening, February 4th. And then within weeks, there was a massive such shutdown. And in fact, the universities closed, there was limits on travel, and in particular, our access to the to the to the greenhouse was vastly restricted. And so what I want to show you is the full growth cycle, that growth cycle after that launch. This is showing you, this is about February or so when we were still actively involved in the greenhouse. And then it reaches a point you'll see in a moment where the greenhouse, uh, where we are absolutely, the greenhouse basically um, shuts down and we're not allowed to go into the greenhouse anymore. And so there's nowhere, there's no way to um, activate the irrigation. So the camera was still running and we had access to the network and the students were still tapping into the, the, um, the camera every night, taking images. But what you see here is something that we didn't expect. And this is, we're able to capture essentially the last phase of the garden. And what is interesting to me, at least, is that what happens is that the garden starts to send out flowers and shoots in almost a desperate attempt to get attention. It is now, it's been denied water here for about two or three weeks. It's definitely struggling and suffering, trying to essentially maintain itself when there's no resources available. It's in a, essentially experiencing an intense drought. And you see this, this struggle of the garden as it's trying to, to, to survive in this context. And to, to, this is the, the, the last image in, in April, um, essentially when it was, the, the garden is, was, 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 was dead. And so this to us became really interesting metaphor. And if you look at this image, I kept looking at this and it reminded me of something. And then it, it struck me that it was, it really reminded me of Guernica, this uh, Picasso's painting um, about the bombing of Guernica and the, the struggle of um, the, the, the sense of, 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 of panic and, um, and, 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 and chaos and, and desperation that happens. And so the, art, the project really came to a different conclusion or a different um, direction than we had originally anticipated. So um, we'll talk more about this uh, with Laura. I want to say that I think this is a, this is very much relevant to our time today, where we're experiencing a massive amount of anxiety about the about nature and the, the the virus in particular, but about politics and economics, and and diversity. There's a, there's so many interesting issues to um, that we're we're struggling with. 
Um, the garden itself, we're going to be extending it. We're, we're looking into new models of companion plants. As I mentioned, we're tuning the parameters. We're going to be evaluating different versions of this on real gardens in the next few, over the next few months. And there is a, just in general, a huge amount of interesting topics related to, to, to gardens and robots. I just want to close by mentioning that you can, you, anyone can, can get involved in this. There's garden robots that are available uh, from a variety of sources. These are a few lawn mowing robots that are out there. There's also a very big trend now toward um, indoor vertical farming. Uh, for especially for herbs and uh, and smaller plants, this is uh, this is being done all over the world. And um, this you can buy this device, and it's um, approximately a little over a hundred U.S. dollars. But it's a it's a garden that you can keep in your in your desk or your kitchen, and um, it, they give you six pods, and you can grow um, you can grow plants on your own. Okay, so I, I, I just want to say we're scratching the surface of all the interesting work that's being done out there in, in robots and agriculture. And this, this challenge here, again, of being able to precisely tailor to be able to respect the dif differences, the unique complexities of, of plants, of the natural world, is an ongoing and I believe really interesting challenge for the world. These are my students in my lab at Berkeley. I want to thank them and all the sponsors uh, of our work. And I will stop there. Thank you so much. So I'll unshare my screen and we can go back. Thank Let's you for see. your presentation, Ken. And um, if you have any questions, please tap it into the uh, chat or in the Q&A um, box. Um, I will start actually. Um, with um, a question myself, so we can keep, kick off our conversation. Um, you were mentioning, Ken, that uh, there was a chat attached to the, tele the original telegarden in 1995 when, well, there were no social media and basically uh, there were just um, mailing lists and chats which could be used for interaction. And a lot has changed since then. So what is the difference in your opinion between the community around the telegarden and the Alpha Garden community? And uh, how can you monitor and how could you monitor that uh, interaction at the time? No, it's a great question, Laura. Thank you so much for asking. I mean, so the, the, the telegarden was essentially designed as a community garden, as you, as you say. And I, the idea was what would happen? What, what kind of community would form? How would it interact? And so we put this chat in there as a sort of almost a second thought, uh, a way for people to, to type in um, text. And it was very primitive. Uh, and, and as you said, there was no social media really at the time. So um, we, you know, there were message boards and, and various uh, lists for, for communication, but this was, it would happen in real time. You could open a window and then you could talk to someone. And we, we, we maintained, we collected all of the, the dialogues that went on again, 24 hours a day. So it ran to hundreds of pages of, um, of dialogues. And so in fact, the team never had time to really read all of it. Um, but we were, we were contacted by, um, by a team of researchers at the University of Washington. I'm gonna put the link in the, in the chat right now. Uh, they wrote a wonderful paper. Um, this is the paper, let's see, can I send it to everybody? Yeah, um, here it is. And this paper is, um, it's by uh, Peter Kahn, Bacha Friedman, and several of their colleagues. And it was about the conversations in the garden. And they found that there was, a, they did a really careful study. They coded all of the gardens. They talked about the, 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 the topics. And it was things like the relationships with nature, the relationships with technology, relationships with humans. And interestingly, it was dominated by relationships with humans that the interactions were really about people saying what about their, 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 what, what their day was like, what the weather was like was a big topic, what, um, what, how they were feeling, what they were working on, and quickly it became in a way less about the garden itself and more about the people. And there were some people who would literally come in every day and they would, they, were, they would greet each other at the same time of the day, they knew each other's names, they would talk about, it was like, you know, meeting over the backyard 
and, uh, and, and connecting with friends. And in fact, there were even, there was even um, two people who apparently got married, uh, who met uh, over the, uh, in the telegarden and became friendly. And then, and then there was a, there was a wedding, um, not in the garden, but they, they actually really did get married. So I think there's a, there's, there's something to be said there about the, the human contact. And the garden was just a, um, was just a, a, a catalyst for people to come together. And that we were, it was very interesting that the, the type of people that came to the garden were, first of all, they were very early adopters of technology because as you noted, not everybody had an internet at that time or a modem. Um, I mean, this is before Wi-Fi. And there was, um, there was also a, uh, a sense that these were people who were essentially guard, interested in gardens and gardening. So there was a kind of nurturing, um, theme that people were very, very friendly. I think it, this is something you do see in oftentimes uh, certain communities where there's um, um, the idea of shared growth and uh, the idea of sharing uh, resources that has a long history, world history. And so people were, came together and they were very, very um, compatible. They were very sociable, very friendly. There was very little negativity. And um, in fact, one thing we left open was the possibility that one person could go in and do a lot of damage. You could, you could plant on top of somebody else's plant, essentially destroying it, or you could overwater the garden. There was no limits on the amount of watering. So someone could just water over water, um, which we did have one incident of that. And so it was very interesting that um, that happened very, very rarely. So people were very, very polite and engaged and sociable. So it was very, it was fascinating to us. So, and then fast forward to, to, to the Alpha Garden. So here we've been struggling and I'm really, really open to ideas from you and anyone online where we're thinking about how we would uh, create the, 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 the kind of community around the, the, the Alpha Garden, because in a sense, Alpha Garden is intended to be autonomous. So there it's the question, and we've discussed this with the team is how can we make it, in, how can we engage with people who want to watch the garden, who want to maybe comment on it, make suggestions. And then we started thinking maybe it's really a way of starting to see it as a, as a, as a, a collective effort in research. So then what we could do is we could, we could have people taking snapshots of different aspects of the garden, sharing what they're finding, what they're seeing, where the garden is failing, where it's working well. And that would be very interesting. So in other words, we're all watching and trying to help the robot essentially get better over time. So that's very exciting to us. And, and that's something we'd like to be able to develop in the next phase. Well, I guess that in this um, COVID-19 crisis, uh, sort of this optimism, this hope that the garden brings along, it's very much welcomed by everybody. So have you thought about this? Have you thought about this uh, element of optimism that this, in this um, sort of challenge between the nature and um, uh, the science, you know, is bringing along? Well, actually, yes. And I, I'm actually happy to see that, um, that some of the team are here. Yahav, Avigal, and, uh, and, um, and Martis is, are here. Um, just looking at who else am I? On the team, if you if you guys want to answer or ask any questions, just type in the chat, and uh, I want to make sure that we recognize you. They've been fantastic, and uh, the, and I have to say, it's a, there's a fairly big team that have worked on the project. In the very first phase, we also had um, we had some 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 biologists involved, and our, another art historian from Harvard was involved. We had designers um, from New York, um, Maya Mann, and um, and um, and Isaac. Blankensmith. So it's been a really wonderful community process the, uh, in, in just de developing this. I think you're absolutely right that the, the co what, what's happened with COVID-19 has really been fascinating to me in that there's been very limited use of artificial intelligence to address this particular problem. I mean, it's, it's a very complex, um, you know, the virus, just to understand the virus, there's been a huge amount of, of research that has gone on in very accelerated fashion. And it's brought together, you know, the biologists and, 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 and clinicians and doctors from around the world. But 
So it'll be interesting later to see how much has AI really changed that. Um, was did AI play a key role? Now, very recently there was a, a result that was announced just a week or so ago from Deep Minds, and it's called AlphaFold, AlphaFold Two, their their latest version of a system that can analyze how how uh, proteins fold, and there's some hope that that could be beneficial in the future for designing new proteins or new molecules that could be useful for a variety of, uh, of, of effects and both for agriculture, but also healthcare. And, um, but there's, and I've been talking with, with colleagues who work in, in that field and they're, they're, they're expressing at the same time, again, caution in, in not jumping to the conclusion that in some sense that AI has solved this complex problem. Nature, understanding the folding of proteins is enormously complex. And so the question is not that, you know, will, will AI take over? I mean, this is, a, this is a fear that we hear over and over again, it dates back to the ancient Greeks. And I want to really push back on that. I feel it's, a, it's, it's really our duty uh, as, as scientists or, and researchers in the field to be more uh, realistic about what AI can do and can't do. And so in this context, your question about, about the complexity of, of biology and nature is that it's staggeringly intricate. And there's so little that we really, that we can really understand. And it's equally true of the brain itself, that we don't understand how the brain works at some fundamental level. Um, a neuroscientist was recently asked, well, if walking a mile, if, we, if, if walking a mile is like understanding how the brain works, how far have we gotten so far? And uh, his answer was about three inches. <laughs> so we've got a long way to go. And I think this is the same is true for, for really understanding nature and, and plant growth and, and viruses as well. That um, this, this, this is a really interesting and rich and complex environment we live in. And how can we make progress? It's gonna take a lot of time. And there's a lot of opportunity for all the young maker fair participants out there in the future. We have a question from Vale Impa. Uh, would you comment on how would this project or projects of this kind could be used and foster citizen engagement and democratization of science in political discourses that touches the relationship between human and nature? Wow, that's a great question. Okay, so that's a big challenge. I think that um, I do. I, first of all, I like the idea of, of citizen science very much that that citizens can get engaged in doing real science and examples of that are often uh, one one beautiful example is in astronomy, where there's a huge uh, community of citizen scientists out there who use their own telescopes and make observations and communicate with each other. And they have done amazing things and discovered comets and, and, uh, and, and, and planetary phenomena. So that is, um, you know, I, and I think when I hear those stories, it's so inspiring because it says that, that anyone um, has potential to, to, to get engaged uh, as most people you know, I think correctly view that science is, is requires a big lab and a lot of advanced machinery and technology and, um, and, and expensive um, resources. But in fact, today, there's a lot of things that can be done by citizens. And so in the protein folding, there was a, essentially a game um, where people would challenge each other to pr fold the proteins. Um, this has been going on for a number of years. Um, Fold it, I think it's called. And there, for example, amateur cryptographers who recently deciphered a, um, um, a code that was written by the Zodiac Killer. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting work and I wanna encourage, uh, especially the Maker Fair participants that there's enormous possibility out there to, to actually get engaged and really not only, you know, trying to do something on your own in a small, you know, experimental way, but also to really get engaged in real science and in citizen science. So if you search citizen science, you'll find quite a bit online as resources there. I think, and that's very much in the spirit of, of Maker Faire. To the bigger question about, um, you know, democratization of science, I'm also very much in favor of 
reaching out to, 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 to new communities and to, to people, I shouldn't say new communities, I should say, in fact, the broader communities than we often see today, that I really want to, want to encourage participation from, from groups that haven't been as active in the, as they have in the past. And I think it's a huge opportunity now with the internet and we also have to be very sensitive to that on the other side, that we have to be reaching out equally and engaging with communities from different environments. So being able to have events that are, that are international, um, to be able to talk and really engage with students and, and applicants to our programs who come from very different backgrounds and really read carefully their applications, communicate with them. And you know, to this point of democratization of science, I think this is essential because when you have diversity in a group, that, that group will be more effective. It'll be more innovative. It'll be more creative. It will be more, more productive at, at solving problems. I, I heartily believe that. So having the democratization is and, and, and diversity in science is so important. And that is in some way a metaphor of what we're trying to do with the polyculture garden, which is to talk about diversity and the plants. That diversity, you know, this idea uh, is 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 very very effective in nature, and I believe it's equally important and fundamental for for culture. Other questions from uh, the audience? Well, I would like to ask you um, a question that I think many of us um, have been wondering about. How does an engineer become an artist in the first place? <laughs> well, interesting. I, I always wanted to be an artist. I, I was interested in, in, in art. My mother painted and, uh, and, and did drawings. And I, 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 I announced that I was going to become an artist. And, and um, my parents said, oh, great. You can become an artist after you get your engineering degree. <laughs> so um, they wanted me to do something practical. and. I, uh, so I did, I went and I, I, I studied engineering. I became very interested in the, in, in essentially the, the similar aspects of engineering, science and art. And what I see is that they both involve a, a really doing research at least is involves a lot of creativity that it's, um, and this is analogous with art that, um, that the art on one hand requires a lot of essentially uh, scholarship and, and study, and as you know this, Laura, I mean, as an art historian, that the rigor that's involved to really know about art is vast. I mean, to even one very specific aspect of Renaissance art, to really, really know it, it requires you know, thousands of hours of study and being able to train your eye to see nuances in a painting and, and relationships between painters and environments and how they influence each other. This is enormously complex. So, for engineers, you know, are used to dealing with complexity, but I want to say that my perception is that there's equal amount of complexity in engineering, where you're trying to learn equations and and and, and theoretical models um, and and calculus, say. But there's the the analogy in in art history is just reading thousands and thousands of pages of analysis and and history and writing. So they both require all this training, and then you have to take that as a foundation and then turn that into a creative process where it's not enough to repeat something that was done before. That if you, you know, that's it, just repeating an experiment is valuable, but it's not really advancing the field in the same way. And so you are encouraged by doing something entirely new. And that's true for artists, uh, you know, artwork. If you, if you, if you redo the same project, uh, there, there's, there's no credit for that. You've got to come up with something that's not only looks new, but is really new conceptually. And that's extremely challenging. And so artists uh, are, are always, you know, thinking about how do we take all these conditions, these trends, and, and turn this into some new form. And there's been enormous amount of productivity in art in that way. It's also true for art historians who are always looking for a new way of interpreting artists' works. And then in, in engineering and research, it's, it's very analogous. I mean, we get very little credit for doing the same thing. I mean, in fact, our papers will not be, you know, are often rejected because it's too similar to what somebody else has done. So we're always encouraged, how do you advance the field? How do you change and do something new? 
so this quest for novelty is is common to art and science and i find that in some sense that um my training as a as a as a, my interest in art and technology has, has been mutually beneficial in that way that they actually thinking creatively is is so much a part of an artist's um instinct that that also is, is helpful in the lab and at the same time i think the rigor of being able to do things and get basically work out all the details and get things precisely you know as as close to to an ideal form as possible is something that engineers are always very um uh concerned with but also is very relevant in the art world so artists are are often very very careful to get you know spending a lot of attention on minute details and in this you know in the tell garden for example or in the alpha garden that we have the same thing that there are so many nuances of getting this garden right literally thousands of emails have gone back and forth and and versions of this it's a it's a it, you know the, the project is so interesting to my mind from both an engineering perspective and from an artistic perspective so i do want to say to to those who are out there from from maker fair is that it is the, those two fields are not are not as different as as commonly thought that in fact the the background and the instincts of of doing new you know innovative science and engineering is very much like like being an artist so i encourage those two if you're interested in both of those go after you know please pursue them both because i think it's, it is possible to do them and and uh but get ready to work because that's the key thing is that both of them require in my mind an equal amount of dedication and hard work so you're saying that your advice for people out there who want to embrace this uh, new path is research, hard work, and keep an open mind, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, very good. Keep an open mind. That's right. Yeah, be, being curious. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up, Laura, because actually I've been thinking about that in regard to some of the politics that have been happening uh, worldwide over the past couple of years, and particularly this year, is that there's often a tendency toward, toward just the opposite toward a very strong view that, um, that, 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 that something is, is, is already known and there's no willingness to listen to alternative viewpoints. And so there's this confirmation bias. It's because it largely it comes out of, in some way, technology because we've, we've made it more feasible for each person to tune into a channel that's very much tuned to their own interests. So whether on social media, where you choose who to follow, or on because there's so many different um, channels available for 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 watching news that you find yourself getting reinforced into a particular point of view and so you're not as open-minded about what new ideas can be out there and also and moreover we get very entrenched and confirmation bias causes us to really get deeper and deeper locked into our own view and when we see some evidence that may contradict our, uh, our long held views, you know, we, we, we don't, we, we cannot accept it, we dismiss it. And that I think is, is, is very problematic and is becoming one of the, the most pressing problems in, of our time is this inability to, to change our minds. And I think that uh, this is where, you know, my sense is that, that, that academics and artists and people involved in creative uh, approaches, uh, creative fields are more open-minded. We have to be. You have to be able to, to, to keep your eyes open about possibilities of change. And in fact, we're very tuned toward them because that's where things get interesting. When something surprises us, uh, that's, you know, when an experiment doesn't turn out as planned, that's interesting, right? That's where it's, I, I don't want, I'm not that interested in having my confirmations uh, my expectations confirmed. That's that's boring. I mean, that's okay, but it's not that interesting. But when things go differently than my expectation, that's really interesting. And that's where I want to dig in deeper. And I want to say that that instinct, as a, I think that's a scientific and engineering instinct, but also very true of artists too, that artists are always looking for what's that new thing? What's that really different that well, that's really weird, you know, I want to try that. I want to experiment with that. That instinct is so valuable. So to your point, I think that open-mindedness is so much a part of, 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 the, of creativity 
and creativity and open-mindedness go together. And so that I, I so feel that it's important to encourage that for, for, for as many people as possible. And again, I'm very conscious that it's a luxury if you're struggling financially or health-wise, you don't always have that luxury. But and so you know, I don't want to claim that everybody needs to go out and be an artist um, or or a researcher. But what I'm saying is that there are elements of those those fields that are that are luxuries, that privileges that we need to enjoy and, and really wrap our head around. That when we have that opportunities, how can we how can we share them, and how can we use that mindset and apply that also to politics and economics and all these challenges that we're facing today. We have a question um, from Oluba Oluwatobi Oinlola. Uh, how, can we, how can we sensitize the African continent to use robotics application, especially farming? Ah, okay, great. Well, I love that question from, from Africa. I, I actually have a connection, strong connection to Africa. I was born in Nigeria in, in, in the 60s, and my parents were there as um, were assisting and teaching in, in a small school there. And, um, and there was, there was a, hu there, a huge amount of, uh, of optimism around the idea of um, Africa becoming independent and um, there was the idea of how to, to build new infrastructure in Africa. It's, I still find Africa to be incredibly, um, have, have incredible amount of, of resources and creativity and richness that I think I want to encourage in the, the embracing in other parts of the world. My experience is that Africans are, have really a, a, a very, interesting and uh, oftentimes nuanced views of aspects that people in the West don't uh, don't appreciate. And the, I mean, this is this you know, we can talk for hours and hours about this. But um, in terms of farming and irrigation, of course, Africa is, has always had enormous amount of, of amazing natural resources. I think that the um, the question is, you know, could could some of these technologies be useful? <clears throat> and for example, I think that there's some real interesting experiments that are being done around drones for <clears throat> being able to, to um, do studies over long distances into areas that are difficult to reach because roads uh, sometimes are not passable due to um, heavy rains, et cetera. So having ability to fly uh, small planes over areas and be able to inspect and um, basically fine tune um, areas of gardening is very interesting. And I also think that, uh, listen, kids around the world get inspired by robots. And so I really believe that if we can make robots available for kids in Africa um, and, and everywhere in the world, really, um, in, in, in South America, um, in Asia, in uh, all over, really, in every, every country has uh, students who, are, uh, who don't have access to these kind of technologies. So one of the things um, was formed a few years ago was the African Robotics Network. And, the, and we actually talked about this at a Maker Faire uh, now almost 10 years ago. But it was um, the Maker Faire, uh, I'm sorry, African Robotics Network or AFRON is still around if you look online. And we held a competition for, to design, for, for people to design an ultra affordable robot for education. And we set the target for that at $10, 10 US dollars. Could we design a robot, a programmable robot that could be only $10? And we, we just set that as an impossible goal. We didn't think anyone could do it. But interestingly, we had competitors from all over the world, uh, 29 entries, and they came up with beautiful ideas, all kinds of designs. They, and they were, they were relatively inexpensive. Some used cardboard, other elements, but they were you know, about 50 to $100, except one. There was, a there was a, an individual, uh, Tom Tilly, who was living in Thailand, and he was a hobbyist and he liked to take apart old Sony game controllers. So he took one apart and he um, transformed it, put wheels on it. And the game controller itself was the, uh, would move around with the wheels, but then he wanted the thumb switches to do something. And so when he would, when it would bump into a wall, he wanted the thumb switches to detect that, but the thumb switches wouldn't, wouldn't activate. So he needed a counterweight 
And so he drilled little holes and he inserted into them two lollipops. <laughs> so this is the lollipop. So he had two lollipops on top. And when it bumped into a wall, the lollipops would tip forward and it would activate the thumb switches. Amazingly brilliant idea. And it was, uh, it won the competition by hands down. Nobody was, everybody was astounded. It was a brilliant idea of innovation. Uh, he ended up calling it the lollipop. And uh, you can learn how to make it yourself again. And the amazing part was the price. It came down to $8.64. So he, he did it. And that kind of ingenuity is what I'm excited about. It was someone who wasn't working in one of the major labs. And he was someone who was you know, thinking in a very different way. And so that's really the biggest message I want to get across is this diversity of thought, of cognitive diversity is so vital and essential. And Groups like Maker Faire and the, the event that we're seeing here to, in, in Rome is a perfect example of this. It's cultivating this kind of diversity of kids and hobbyists and people from all different backgrounds coming together and getting new ideas, getting inspired. I think it's an absolutely wonderful thing. And I think it's about, it's gonna really be the, the, the brightest source of the future of our, of our species and our planet. We have time for a last question from the audience. If there aren't any, um, well, the Alpha Garden, it's a bit of a challenge between the natural and the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. For which part are you rooting for? Can you tell us? <laughs> yes, I'll tell you, Laura. I am rooting for natural intelligence. I, I, I have to say, I find the fact that the brain is still a mystery to be incredibly uh, sort of just... Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm still happy that we don't understand the brain. I think it's, it's because that the, the brain is, is this sort of incredible frontier of nuance and complexity and that, the, the, that, that it's so rich and, 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 and um, intricate and, and nature itself ha works in such really fascinating ways. It helps us to really get a perspective on ourselves and our, um, let's call it humility, um, that, 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 that keeps us grounded in some sense, that you know, there, are, there are mysteries right here, right, 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 right inside our own, uh, everyone's mind, right? We don't have to go to the far, farthest galaxies and understand the universe, but just right here, we have mysteries. So I find that very reassuring that, the, that science is, has limits and that there's, well, there's a huge amount to do. There's a lot of opportunity, but it's also that science is not something that can just come in and take control. It has to, it has to struggle and has to work and has to, all these things we talked about, that it is, that, that, that science is a process and it's a long process. It, re it requires lots of, of, of effort and viewpoints and, and experiments and, and failures and, and, and struggles and, 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 then, and then moments when there's, mo there's breakthroughs. So I'm glad that we haven't quite solved, um, that there's many problems that we haven't solved, frankly. I mean, I think that's, that I take a lot of consolation in that. And I think there's many, many problems too that we'll be working on for, for the next decades and, and probably hundreds of years. So to me, that's good news. Well, I'm happy to end this uh, beautiful presentation um, with this such a positive and optimistic tone. Uh, thank you so much, Ken, for your brilliant presentation. And thank you, everybody, for coming along. Uh, thanks again to the Maker Fair for the organization. And uh, have a good evening, guys. All right. Ciao, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.